When I was a young man, I worked the night shift in a local supermarket. Probably not the best job in the world, but definitely an important learning experience nonetheless. Anyway, on the nights when I wasn't working, I'd find myself at a loss. Not able to uh, sleep at a regular hour, I would take myself off on uh, long road trips around the local countryside. It's amazing what your mind will do to you when you're out on the road, in the pitch black of night, in the middle of nowhere. All kinds of crazy thoughts come to your mind. Tonight's story is very reminiscent of those times in my life, I have to tell you. Well, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And listen. It had jumped right in front of my sedan before I could blink. I'd hit the brakes, the road fighting my hands for control of the wheel. I felt my body lurch as the car skidded to a halt, my nose within centimetres of slamming into the twelve o'clock position on the wheel. Feeling my lungs suck in the breath I didn't even know I'd been holding, I opened my mouth to say something, but all that came out was empty air. My mind played the event over and over again, like I was being forced to watch a bad movie and was looking for any haphazard reason to leave the theatre. Ignoring my heartbeat, which was bouncing around the inside of my skull, I focused on the only other sound in the compartment. Is that me breathing? I sounded weak, almost childlike. It was hard to believe that the sound was coming from a thirty-year-old man whose large hands were still gripping the wheel like he'd meant to strangle it to death, as if it had been responsible for the accident and not me. Looking at myself in the mirror, I watched as my dark eyes trembled like peas rolling down a vertical surface. Chastising myself for being so shaken up, I took deep, steadying breaths. I had to get it together. I was a grown man. Not the frightened little kid who used to sleep underneath the covers as a boy. Once I'd finally wrangled my breathing under control, I unhooked myself from the seatbelt and opened the door. The familiar one tone, a warning to drivers that the door was ajar, sounded louder than necessary. The only light came from the headlights, a dullish white, as if the car was blinking its eyes from the impact. The air was cold. Not Albany cold, mind you. It was more like Meadowlands cold, the kind of weather Giants fans were familiar with. Good football weather. I wasn't used to these roads. The last sign I'd seen leading me back to New York City was a long time ago. In fact, I couldn't really recall the last time I'd seen a passing car, which was rare. Traffic to the Big Apple was always high on the I-95. Looking round, I found myself hoping that another car would happen by, that another driver would see a fellow citizen in distress and would pull over to see if I was okay. Looking at the sizable lump on the dirt road, my legs started approaching it without my express command. Loose gravel crunched beneath my feet, each step heavier than the last. The trees surrounded it on either side, like police tape hemming the scene of a crime. With the forest around me, it almost felt like I was on trial and making my way to the witness stand to plead my case before a hostile jury. A horrible thought crossed my mind as I'd reached the halfway point between the car and the body. Had it been an animal? Or had I just killed a human being? If it had been a man, had he felt any pain as I barreled into him? Did he have time to utter so much as a gasp, a whimper? Or had he just slumped to the middle of the road, a broken piece of flesh and bone? Had he seen my face before it happened? I suddenly felt like a criminal looking to cover up all the evidence of my crime. It sounds silly, I know, but you think of all kinds of crazy things when guilt rides shotgun in the passenger seat of your car. I kept telling myself it was an accident, but still, I was scared. I'd always been a quiet man. I'm the nail that never gets hammered because I don't stick out. I'm the cog in the machine, the fly on the wall. I'm the kind of guy who didn't look for attention or had bad things happen to him. I'm nobody. But the guilt was still there. Guilt was behind me, nudging me each step closer to the body of the man I'd just killed. 
he whispered into my ear, telling me that here in the woods there were many places to hide a body. He said that no one would ever have to know, that I could go on with my spotless record and that no one would be the wiser. Another voice told me to get back in my car and run, to bolt like the devil's patrol car was coming up to the scene and I had to get away. That was fear, guilt's backseat driver. He's the kind of guy who was busy telling you where to go and what to do, heedless of the circumstances or the destinations. His voice was louder now, drowning guilt's words in its high-pitched tones. I almost gave in, almost shoved them both aside to dive into the safety of my teal-coloured sedan when I stopped. As my mind struggled to formulate words to describe the thing before me, I suddenly felt very alone. Both guilt and fear fell silent as they joined me in observing this oddity. The body had two spindly legs the length of pole vaults, which were coiled beneath a bulbous body as if he had meant to jump out of the way. I couldn't really tell what colour it was, only that it had a fleshy exterior that caught some of the glow of the headlights. If I had to guess, I would say that the skin had to be somewhere between yellow and pink. <laughs> but I was more concerned with identifying the species rather than the pigment. Pigment. Pig. The body almost did resemble a pig, if said pig had two long legs that ended in wide, flat feet instead of hooks. Two toes adorned each foot the inside ones being larger than the outside. Upon closer inspection of the legs, I discovered that the knees bent at a strange angle. At first I thought that they had been damaged in the accident, but then I realised, or thought I realised, for I was no expert on fauna, that the animal's legs were simply bent the opposite way. The wrong way. What are you? I asked. It didn't answer. How could it? I just crashed into it at 80 miles an hour in a 2010 sedan. Anything strong enough to survive that would surely have gotten up by now to kick my ass. Looking at the size of those legs, this animal was powerful enough to stomp me to death. I almost whistled my relief when I noticed something moving at the far end of the carcass. Carcass? It was amazing how one categorized things. Had it been a man, it would have been a corpse. Since it was an animal, it was a carcass. Like a worm digging its way out from beneath a rock. It was squirming so violently that I actually heard it scraping against the ground. It's the kind of sound a dog would make when it's trying to dig its way under a door. Once I saw it, I had to physically restrain myself from throwing up. It was long and wriggling, creating a disgusting, fleshy sound that brought to mind body chunks of meat splattering to the floor. It kept climbing out from beneath the body, getting longer with each passing second. The tail, if that's what it was, was segmented like a centipede, only it had no legs and was about a foot in width. It sort of reminded me of a rat's tail which made my hand instinctively cover my mouth. The sound it was making, I would never forget it for as long as I lived. I took one voluntary step backwards, the tip of the tail rearing up in my direction, now at its full six-foot length. At this point, it remained very still, like it was observing me. I couldn't see any eyes. At least it stopped squirming to my ears' content. The sound was like a hundred wet willies, a hundred soggy fingers wriggling their way down your earlobes and into your brain. I would have removed my hand from my mouth, pre-vomit be damned, if I wasn't suddenly frozen in place. The tail remained perfectly still. I was tempted to take another step back when the thing suddenly began flailing around as if coming down with a sudden case of madness. Wet sounds accompanied the motion, increasing my urge to vomit. In the illumination of my headlights, I spotted something dark oozing its way out from underneath the body. 
The dark stuff was blood, slowly pooling from the wounds suffered in the collision. My nose picked up the metallic scent easily. Even the smell of the forest wasn't enough to shroud its stench. The blood carried with it a strange musk that was difficult to describe. Putrid and powerful, it assailed every one of my senses. I could hold it in no longer. Bending over, I retched my innards onto the road. Between the ugly, wet sounds and the horrible stench, combined with the mere sight of the tail, my tolerance had had its limit. As it was, all I could do was just stumble backward until I collided with the hood and slipped right off. Once on the ground, I turned around, ignoring the glare from the headlights as I tried to focus. The thing's blood was all over the hood, along with a dent inscribed by its body. How I hadn't noticed it before was anyone's guess. Perhaps I'd been too shocked to take stock of the damage. From the looks of it, the thing had given almost as well as it had received. Were it not for the blood, which was a sickly green-black colour, I could have ridden inside the dent while the car was in motion. Damn, that'll be a bitch to clean, I thought. I put it out of my mind. I had put a lot of things out of my mind just then. Between the slippery noise and the smell... My stomach and eardrums felt like they were ready to abandon ship and high tail it out of there. I decided to go with them. Getting on both my knees, I grimaced as I felt sharp rocks, like tiny teeth, prickling my legs. The road I was on, if it could even be called a road, lacked any pavement whatsoever. It was simply a dirt path in the middle of the forest that was covered in loose stone and sand. I stood up then, but a commotion to the back drew my watery eyes to the creature, which had somehow gotten up. Its two legs, while skinny, were strong enough to lift its impressive girth right off the ground. Like placing a large pig's gluttonous form atop a pair of ostrich legs, the animal reared itself up, higher than I was tall, if one could believe it. I hadn't taken proper stock of its height while it had been lying supposedly dead on the road. Now the yellow-pink chest was up higher than my head, the blood dribbling like a leaky faucet from a sharp gash beneath the belly where a cracked rib poked out. If the thing wasn't dead now, then it soon would be, I realized. But my attention was drawn elsewhere. As I stood up, my back again connecting with the bent and bloodied hood of the car, my eyes were fixed on the tail. It was agitated, whip-like, as it swung this way and that, like it was feeling the air. But that's not what frightened me the most. Even though the fear of that thing touching me was still there, no. What was most terrifying was the fact that the tail was the only other appendage on the animal's body. It whipped back and forth atop the bulk, its serpentine form emitting a whistling sound through the air. That was its head. There was no other rationality that my mind could come up with. What I had originally thought to be the tail was actually the damn thing's head. God. But it was no use asking the Almighty for an explanation. No God would have made a creature such as this. It was an abomination. It was a freak. It wasn't natural. A scream in the back of my throat threatened to push the bile out of the way, but I fought them both back. The strange pig ostrich thing lurched once in my direction. That was all the incentive I needed to get my ass back in the car. I slammed the door so hard that the car visibly shook. Safely inside, all I could do was tremble like the child I once was. The creature, full on in the headlights, continued to lurch my way, the head feeling the air around it. It was looking for me, I thought. Shaking, I suddenly remembered I had a cell phone and pulled it out the way someone would a firearm. Wishing it had been a gun instead, I began to frantically dial the police my eyes glued to the approaching creature. 
It paused in its approach. For a moment, I hoped that it was considering going away, like it had seen me pull out the cell phone and was thinking to leave before the cops arrived. I sat there, watching it watch me, the head coiling and flexing while its lifeblood continued to pool at its wide feet. I could only stare back, afraid that if I looked away, if I even lost sight of the creature for a moment, that it would somehow get to me. The rational side of me, what little of it remained, knew that it couldn't get to me inside the car. I had struck it head on. It was hurt, bleeding. Even if it did survive, it was in no condition to retaliate. I was safe. This car was my shield. It was a blanket I now used to protect myself from the dark. You can't get me in here. I'm safe now. I am getting no signal. The dead air filled the space between my ear and the phone, deafening every other sense. Like a tear in the blanket, my protective barrier came crashing down around me. It wasn't so much that I feared that the beast, sensing my vulnerability, would now break through the windshield to get me. I was afraid that it now understood that I was completely alone. Like a child hiding under the covers, mum and dad wouldn't hear me scream. No one knew I was here. I was completely alone while the proverbial boogeyman opened the closet door. Oh, you are shitting me, I cried out. Though my obscenity was aimed at the phone, my eyes were fixed on the animal. The head began to twirl again. With each motion, more blood seeped out of the wound. One would think it meant to wrench itself dry, like squeezing the water out of a towel. Dropping my phone, I slammed my palm on the horn. Get out of here! My hand became a fist. I banged the wheel as hard as I could, the impact reverberating throughout my body. Go on, piss off! I didn't even know if the thing had ears, yet somehow it knew I was here. Maybe it could smell me the way some animals could smell the air. Or perhaps it could feel the subtle vibrations I made. The car engine was still running. No doubt it could feel me then. Just leave, I told myself. Just hit the gas, run it over, and find your way back to the I-95. Putting the car back into drive, I was about to do just that when the creature began to tremble violently. It began to roll its head around in the air creating an eerie whistling sound that pierced the night. It was so high-pitched that I was forced to cover my ears. Gritting my teeth, I screamed at it to stop. Fuck, I screamed. Without thinking, I slammed on the accelerator. The car lurched forward like a rocket. The creature made no move to dodge, but remained bleeding on the road, its entrails slowly seeping out. While the whistling continued to fill the air, it was soon drowned out by the sudden impact of steel on bone. The creature silenced. I screamed. This time the impact sent the creature barreling over the hood of the car. The windshield shattered, showering me with glass. It continued its death roll over the roof, down the trunk and into the road behind me. Hitting the brakes... I peered into the rearview mirror. I could see the body lying there, unmoving. It seemed dead, and I found myself praying that that was so. I was half tempted to back up and run it over, when I stopped to think of the damage that would do to the muffler. The windshield was gone. The front of the car was littered with glass, and more of the disgusting blood that reminded my vomit that it was on its way not too long ago. I finally gave in, not bothering to step out of the car and loosed my bowels on the passenger seat. Sorry, guilt. Once that was done, I sat up again, eyes glancing back at the animal to make sure it was still there. It remained still. Even the head, the disgusting worm thing I'd previously mistaken for a tail, 
was lying slumped against the bulbous body, right next to a seriously disfigured leg. Where did you come from? I said to the beast, ignoring my suddenly bad habit of talking to dead things on the road. I looked myself in the mirror to check out the damage. Only a few cuts from the glass. Nothing missing. Some blood that wasn't mine. Oh, shit. I'm going to smell like dead monster for the remainder of my ride. It was sad to admit, but I had managed to build up a mild resistance for the smell. Enough that I wasn't hurling anymore. It was still gross, and I wondered what did that thing eat that made its insides smell so bad. For that matter, how did it eat? There wasn't an orifice anywhere on its body. I had to step out. With the open door alarm going off again, I rid my clothes of the broken glass and wished I could do the same with the blood. I kept looking at the monster to make sure it was still dead and not sneaking up on me while I was distracted. Stop it, I snapped, but not at the carcass. You're a man. Now, act like it. I knew I was right. There was absolutely no reason for me to feel so jumpy. My biggest concern, besides showering, would be finding out just where I was and how I planned to get back on the highway. This little detour grew less and less real in my mind, though... Whether it was my subconscious trying to block it out or make sense of what had just happened, I couldn't tell. I was just happy it was over. I had slain the monster. I was a hero. The boy had become a man. I chuckled despite my circumstance. Leave it to the ego to reassert itself after a harrowing experience in an attempt to make one feel safe again. Why were you when fear and guilt were bothering me, Mr. Ego? I spared the monster one quick glance and had an idea. I could take a picture of it using my phone. No one would believe me. Not my friends, not my family, not the cops, or the mechanic whose job it would be to fix the car, of what I had seen unless I brought back proof. Reaching into the car, I began to fumble for the phone I'd dropped when I heard it. The most ear-slicing whistle one could imagine sounded out from a long way off. I actually slammed my head against the roof when I frantically jumped back out, expecting to defend myself against a suddenly resurrected pig-ostrich monster. From somewhere in the distance, a long way back down the road where I'd come from, I heard several loud whistles screeching through the dark, like a dozen banshees finding their way out of hell. The keen echoed for some time, before silencing. Terrified, I looked toward the dead animal. Sure, it was bigger than me, but there was no way it could have made a noise like that. Whatever had screamed, its keen whistle was far stronger than the thing I'd just killed. Could it have been a herd of them, I wondered? Was the whistling sound the pig ostrich had made... Some sort of call to its fellows somewhere in the woods, telling them about the intruder, about me. I didn't want to wait to find out. Getting back in the car, I shut the door, put on my belt, and sped off. In the rearview mirror, the monster's carcass grew smaller with each passing second. I was torn between keeping my eyes on the road and looking back expecting a hundred of those things to come chasing me out of the darkness. That forced me to hit the pedal even harder. With the windshield broken, the wind was slapping me in the face, stinging, like the cold hand of death. I squinted through it as best I could, hoping that I'd spot something, a road marker, anything, that would lead me back to civilization. After some distance, I'd considered looking for my phone again. The road was so dark, so desolate, it would take all of my concentration to avoid another accident. Of course, the smart thing to do would have been to stop the car and look for the phone then. But I wasn't about to stop. I had no idea what had made those sounds. But stopping now seemed more suicidal than rummaging in the passenger seat floor for my missing cell phone. 
Shards of glass that had once been my windshield fell off the dashboard and onto my knees. Blood, dirt, vomit. My clothes were a real mess. The remnants of the thing's putrid stench still clung to me. The hood of my car was stained with it, as was the front seat from where the blood spattered after I'd run it over. Peering through the dark, my headlights resembling flashlights more than powerful beams, I could barely see five feet in front of me. Where am I? My voice sounded so small. It was demeaning, but I couldn't deny the fact that I was scared. My breathing was quick, frantic even. When I spared the chance to look in the mirror, my pupils had become so dilated that they were almost invisible. My palms were so sweaty that the wheel became harder to hold onto. More than once I swerved, the tree line coming dangerously close. I always managed to pull away at the last second, but this was becoming a night of close calls. Oh, get it together, I kept telling myself. You're okay, just, just forget about what you heard. You're fine. You... I stuttered. I wasn't fine. I had to take control, else someone would find me in my car squashed against the trees come morning. Like it or not, I had to catch my breath. With every ounce of willpower I could muster, I gradually pulled my car to a stop. Eyes fixed on the rearview mirror, I found a very frightened child staring back at me. I was a boy again. Phone! I snapped at my image. I reached into the floor on the passenger side, cursing as a few loose shards of glass sliced my fingers like cheese on a cutter, until they finally clutched the elusive phone. Looking for the bars on the display that indicated signal strength, my heart sank when I saw none. I opened up my contact menu and began calling home anyway. The buttons beeped when I pressed them, but dead air was the only reply I received for my trouble. Come on. I began going through my contacts, hoping that at least one would pick up. One would think that Dead Air was the only person I spoke to, for he was always there, chastising me with silent quips. Oh, shit. I kept on with a litany. I began to rock back and forth, like an irritated child whose mother didn't come to him on the first cry. The chair began to buck with me, and I slammed my fist down on the wheel. Shit. Falling back on my chair, the ordeal had exhausted me. Frustration joined in on my little carpooling venture, sitting between fear and the dead air in the back seat, the trio shaking their heads at my latest tantrum. In the passenger side, covered in glass, guilt had finally shut up. They were all criticizing me, and why not? A little noise had spooked me. Dropping the phone, I leaned against the wheel and began sulking. I had no idea what was going on. I remember being on the road and driving home, when I suddenly hit that pig ostrich thing with a worm for a head. Where the hell had that come from? How did I wind up in its neck of the woods? What was that sound I'd heard? Slowly, my head came up. The car engine was still purring, albeit weakly. The lights were as dim as ever, and for a brief moment, I thought I'd seen shadows creeping around the edges. There was nothing there, of course, just my mind trying to give focus to my fear. I was scared not being able to see what I was afraid of. Fear needed a shape, something tangible to give it limits. And limits were things that could be exploited. If it could be exploited, then it could be beaten or killed. But fear had no such designs. Mine was an invisible monster that had hounded me since the days of my youth. It began as a monster that waited in the closet until I was asleep, before it would come out to poke my head full of nightmares. As I grew up, I thought I'd managed to control it, to beat it back with my years of experience. But my fears never truly went away. My monsters were always with me, clinging to me like the worm thing's blood. 
it would never go away. Somehow, after leaving my childhood home and going off on my own, I still managed to stumble back right into my nightmares, like they'd been waiting for me all this time. That monster I'd just killed had simply been their ambassador. It was there to remind me that I could never get away, no matter how far I ran. I am not afraid, I told the shadows. I am not afraid. I looked myself in the mirror at the child that I was. I am not afraid. It was like staring into my own soul, and it was difficult. It's never easy to see yourself for who you really are. Trying to overcome oneself was like being a puddle in the ocean. The currents were always present always bigger and stronger than you would ever be. No matter how determined the puddle, it could never swim against the currents. It could never stop being helpless. I am not afraid, my voice raised. I... I stopped. For a moment, the shadows in the mirror behind the car seemed to move, like my mantra had ruffled them a bit. A low dread developed at the bottom of my heart. Then, like spoke billowing up a chimney, it worked its way up until it literally suffocated my ability to think rationally. To be honest, I wasn't thinking anymore. I felt it, that presence that was so unwanted as death, and yet so easily recognisable. It was coming from down the road, in the direction where I'd heard the noise, back where I'd left the pig ostrich. My forehead began twitching, as if some part of me that knew what was coming was trying to tell me to flee. I didn't listen at first. I was too scared. Like being back home, I didn't need to hear the closet door creak open. I just sensed the monster in my closet, slowly creeping out. It was an archaic sixth sense, the one all adults were trained to ignore, but that children fully embraced. That sense was telling me that I was in danger, that this was not a good place to be and I needed to leave now. But I didn't move. My eyes remained fixated on the mirror as I sensed the dread coming. And then I heard it, those same whistling sounds that spurred me into running in the first place. It was enough to snap me out of my fear-induced coma. Like a bullet in the barrel of a gun, I fired my car down the dark tunnel of the forest. All around me, the trees seemed to lean forward, giving me precious little space to maneuver. I didn't care about space at the moment. I just wanted to fly. Fly down the dark passage like an arrow loosed from its bow. Even with the pedal all the way to the floor, I still didn't feel like I was moving fast enough. I could hear the whistling sounds, a keen noise so sharp it was impossible to believe it had been made by any human instrument, and it was growing louder. Though the engine was rumbling, it sounded like a mere cat's purr compared to the sound that was following. The whole road began to shake, as something large and heavy was rapidly closing the distance. Like a kid trudging his way up a hill on a tricycle, I lurched my body back and forth, like the momentum would grant me some extra speed. It didn't. I could hear the desperation in my breathing, the growing paranoia. The wind was literally blowing me back into my seat, but I didn't care. I needed to get away. I needed to escape. Mom and Dad won't save you. Go! I screamed, go, go, and then I saw it, my eyes widening in the rear view mirror, lurching like tree trunks, two enormous flat feet, each wider than the car was long, crushed the road behind me, they were each connected to a pair of legs that ran up beyond my field of sight in the mirror. I could not begin to imagine the size of the body those gargantuan feet held up. Judging from the tremors, and the way my heart leapt to my throat with every thump, it must have been huge. The 
feet closed the distance to my sedan easily enough. One more step. Ah, it was a pancake. But before that final step, something leered down into the view of the back window. A thousand writhing, wriggling, squirming worm things, each ten times the size of the single one of the pig ostrich I'd killed. They seemed to be reaching for the car like boneless fingers. I screamed as they broke the back window. I could feel them reaching for me inside the car. The sickening sound made by the tiny worm thing was multiplied a hundredfold with these far larger appendages. Always, there was the whistling and the sloppy slaps, a perpetual noise of ghastliness, and though my mouth was gawking, I couldn't even hear my own cries. The car bucked to the side. I stepped on the accelerator even harder, not caring if the car was already moving at top speed. One of the massive feet stomped on the ground so hard that the car actually rose off the ground. I hit my head on the roof, biting my tongue as my jaws slammed shut upon impact with the road. One of the giant worm things slammed through my window, cutting me with glass and deafening me with its whistling. Like a giant serpent, it coiled around me, pulling at me. I tried to fight it off, punching it, but I might as well have tried to fight off a tiger with one finger. More of them came from the back, all working their way to the front. To me. I was desperate. The giant worm thing was tightening around my neck. I bit down hard, the blood of my wounded tongue mixing with the putrid and mucky blood of the tentacle as it retracted. Though momentarily free, my whole world became blurry. The creature's blood. It felt like poison. I was sicker at that moment than I'd ever been in my life. My head swam and my eyes felt like they were going blind. Another worm thing grabbed at me from behind, attempting to finish what its partner had begun. Though delusional, I was still coherent enough to recognize the danger I was in and turn the wheel as far as it would go. The whole world spun out of control. I could feel several tentacles around me at that moment, but they disappeared just as soon as the car tipped over and was literally levitated off the ground and into the trees. The tire screeched as if screaming, as terrified as I was by the whole ordeal. The monsters whistled, filled the night air. Those shrill sounds burrowed into my head like a thousand drills. I almost found myself wishing that the tentacles would have engulfed me instead, for at least then they would have muffled the sound. As it was, my whole body had become so numb from the ordeal that I didn't see or feel anything anymore. All I could hear was the whistling as it followed me into darkness. I don't know how long I'd been out. When I awoke, my head was slumped against my chest, ears ringing. While I was essentially deaf, my other senses kicked in one after the other. Foremost among them was the pain. I felt the cuts and bruises all over my body, no doubt a direct result of broken glass and tumbling steel. My nose picked up the scent of smoke and gasoline, and I knew without opening my eyes, that the engine had been busted and was leaking. I opened my eyes to find myself in complete darkness. The car was totaled. That much I could tell just by the feel of it. The dashboard was bent inward to the point where the wheel was digging into my thighs. Afraid, I tried to move my legs and found them stuck. Fortunately, I could still feel my toes and realized that Despite the clinch, my legs remained whole. The impact had actually loosened my chair, and I could feel it swivel. It wasn't made to do that. If I hadn't been wearing my seatbelt, I'd no doubt have gone rocketing out of the window, plastering myself against a tree. Imagining myself as a human pretzel, I suddenly came full awake. Shaking, I felt myself with damages and was relieved, almost frantically so, that I was still in one piece. My ears were still ringing, and I couldn't see a thing, but that didn't stop me from observing my surroundings. 
The smell of gasoline had become overpowering. I had seen enough movies to know that that was never a good thing, and immediately unhooked myself from my seat. Once I thought this car my protector. Well, if I had remained, it would soon be my coffin. The problem was getting my legs out from beneath the crushed dashboard. That took some fighting, and more than a few exaggerated grunts. Though I couldn't hear it, I could still feel my body's breathy exertion. I began banging my shoulder against the door in an attempt to gain more leverage. It took some doing, but I was able to shove the crumbled door aside. It gave way, surprisingly enough, having been loosened from its hinges in the crash, and only my awkward position on the swiveling chair had prevented me from putting my full force behind each blow. With the extra space, I decided to pull myself out of the trap instead, slowly worming my way out from the dashboard much in the same way that the smaller worm thing had done with its bulbous body on our first contact. Thinking about it brought back the fear that I wasn't alone. No sooner was I free than I pressed my back against the car, using it as cover. It was too dark to see, though the ringing in my ears had subsided somewhat, so I could at least make out my own raspy breathing. Time seemed to stand perfectly still. I was alive and otherwise okay, but I was still alone and in danger. Now that my car was wrecked, I had no way of escaping this dark forest. The creature could still be out there. It could be looming over me right now. I strained to focus my ears, to fight past the ringing. I had to know where it was. I wouldn't expunge myself from my hiding place until I did. A red light came up to my right. Turning, I spotted the growing fire around the engine and cursed. It was about to go up. Monster or no, if I remained here, then I would die. I cursed again. My self-preservation instinct was torn between remaining behind the car and running for my life. On wobbly legs that felt more like jelly than solid muscle, I rushed out from behind the car. The growing fire had done at least some good. It provided me with enough light to see the immediate forest. My car had nosedived into a rather large tree whose top went beyond the fire's range. Crushed, the engine gurgled like a drowning victim. Soon it would explode. I ran far enough away that the blast wouldn't hurt me and hid behind the nearest tree. Taking a moment to catch my breath, I poked my head around to see my only transportation going up in flames. My cellular phone was still in there for all the good it did me. I guess someone had to go down with the ship. Through the din in my ears, I was able to make out the crackling sound of the fire. Even from this distance, I could still feel the heat. I realized my good sense to escape had come just in the nick of time, for the whole sedan went up like a brilliant ball of flame. The explosion hit me like a kick in the chest, and I fell onto my back. In that brief flash, the smoke billowing into the night, I spotted the one thing I'd never wanted to see again. Like a gargantuan sentry awoken from its slumber, the monster had been standing not too far away. I could only make out its legs, for the torso was still far beyond my range of sight. It seemed startled by the blast, which caused those two great legs to scamper back, sending tremors through the ground. I heard that whistling again, high and startled. It probably couldn't have found me while I was out cold. Maybe its vision was based on movement, the way its smaller cousin seemed to notice me when I... Oh, God. Its smaller cousin. A horrifying thought ran through my mind just then. And that pig ostrich thing being the larger creature's offspring, had I killed not a smaller relation of the two-legged titan, but its own child? Was I the guilty party here? I was the outsider, the stranger to these woods. I had killed one of its own, and this beast, this towering monstrosity, was charged with bringing me to justice. One more look at those long legs, 
remembering the whistling sound emitted by both parent and child. And I knew that I was a murderer. As the fire subsided, one of the giant legs took one lumbering step in my direction. Guilty or not, I wasn't about to be eaten alive. I got up, turned and ran into the forest. It was impossible to see anything with the fire so far behind me. I flailed my arms ahead of me for fear of plowing head first into a tree. I could feel the giant shaking the ground behind me. The trees might have slowed it down a little, but the stomps became less frequent the further I went into the woods, but I wasn't about to stop to take a look. Knowing it could cover a distance in a single step with what would take me a hundred, I ran. I stopped caring about whether I crashed into something anymore. I just ran. Getting away was all I cared about. My balance gave way the same time the ground did. It was like falling forever down a bottomless pit, except I hit every crag and rock on the way down. I tumbled so far that I ceased to think altogether. Every nerve in my body was on fire, a pain amplified with every scrap and bruise the tumble saw fit to bestow on me. Only when I stopped, broken like the smaller pig ostrich that I had run over, was I able to breathe again. I struggled onto my back, groaning, for I knew a few bones had been popped out of place. The pain was excruciating. But despite it all, I realized that my hearing had returned just in time for me to hear my own anguished cries. I could hear the monsters whistling in the distance. Far, but not too far away. It wouldn't be able to catch up with me if it really wanted to. I sat up slowly. Movement was a luxury that I was paying with every jolt of pain. Though I couldn't see it, I knew the leg was broken. Only the adrenaline pumping through my body kept me from blacking out at that moment. I was almost too glad for the darkness. At least, this way. I couldn't see the horrendous shape my body was in. Then I saw a strange, purple light piercing the night sky above my head. As I looked, the clouds parted to reveal what I thought at first to be the moon. Then, as I looked closer with strained eyes... I spotted a second heavenly body in the sky. A second moon. This one slightly smaller than the first. As the clouds pulled back, it allowed the two moons to illuminate the forest all around me. I was currently sprawled on a bluff overlooking a strange alien landscape. The trees, tall as they were, looked more like giant blades of crooked grass whose tops swayed in the wind. The forest went around, unendingly, into the horizon, across countless thousands of miles of wild country. The night seemed to come alive as the moons lit up, awakening the denizens of the forest. I couldn't believe it. It's like I'd stumbled into a void into some far-off planet. This wasn't the world I knew, it wasn't even Earth. My pain suddenly forgotten, I winced as I heard the monster's whistle fill the sky. It was similar in tone to the smaller one, the one the baby had emitted prior to my running it over. It carried for miles in every direction, but at least it wasn't getting any closer. The thick forest of blade-like trees must have prevented it from following me. But then... I heard something else. From my vantage point on the bluff, I picked up several more whistles, each a response to the first. Several of the trees shifted, as if something was moving beneath them. A few things poked out from the very top of the canopy, many of them taller than the highest tree. I saw, to my own horror, countless giant tentacles reaching for the sky adding their own whistles to that of the first one. The alien forest was alive with them. Scores of the monstrous, long-legged pig ostriches, with their wormy appendages feeling the air. They were searching for me, no doubt, 
having been alerted by the first giant's warning about the intruder in their forest. It probably told them about the death of the little one as well. When it failed to catch me, it had called for help. Now a whole forest of giants were slowly making their way to my bluff at the edge of the dark woods. I just sat there, watching as my doom slowly approached. Once my adrenaline had subsided enough, I might be too racked in pain from my own injuries to care that I was being stepped upon, or worse, eaten. This was justice, I told myself, for being where I didn't belong. In an attempt to kill my nightmares, my nightmares had learned to fight me back. This wasn't my bedroom. I could no longer hide under the covers or call my parents when I was scared. I couldn't call for help because there was no help. I looked up at the two moons in the sky and wondered if, beyond them, on a planet with only one moon, a little boy was staring back at me through space and time, wondering if there was such a thing as a world without monsters. Sadly, I just had to stumble into one full of them. Well, like I said, that uh, reminded me a lot of uh, a period of my life when I couldn't really get to sleep at night and so I'd take myself off on trips around the local uh, countryside, find myself out in the middle of nowhere dark of night, with no one around me for miles, and your mind really just start playing tricks on you, I can tell you. So, um, quite a fantastical story, but elements of it I could definitely relate to. So, tell me what you thought of that one. I really enjoyed reading that one, and uh, hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I did making it for you. Well, another long one, but of course I will be back with you again on Friday. The excitement and the joy never ends, does it? <laughs> well, that's the plan anyway. Well, my dear friends, thanks for listening once again. Wishing you all sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>